were you born and raised in the states? Or? I was, yeah. I was born in Texas. Awesome. And is that like, yeah. um, like where your family's from as well? Is that like where you've sort of like embedded yourself into? Is that like your your space? Um, the states, yeah. the U.S. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've never lived anywhere else. Uh, my parents both immigrated from India at cool. very different times in their lives um, through Canada, though so that's where they met. Awesome. And but they neither of them have much of a connection to India, mm-hmm. and so I've I've grown up like very American. Um, and yeah, just very, we've kind of lived in various places in the States and these days I'm in New York. And what was your journey into like tech and software development? What did that look like for you? Were your parents in tech or was it something you sort of like fell into or stumbled upon? They were both uh, scientists, but neither of them are really in technology. Um, I did have a Commodore 64 when I was very little, um, and my dad showed me kind of how to write a program, which my first program printed I love you mom in random colors uh, in an infinite loop and so that and I was about six years old when I wrote that so or when really he showed me how to write that but then I kept like we had a book of some kind like a software manual and we kept like I kept copying like programs out of it and then I would like tweak them a little bit and that's kind of how I started so I've been doing it for a while and I think it has like really shaped my thinking processes in what way? And it's very easy for me to see the patterns in things, um, which maybe it's it's very easy for me to see certain kinds of structural patterns in things, um, particularly anything serialized. So stories, actually, it's like I, I grasp narrative structure very easily. Um, and... Languages you would think might be easy for me, and they they aren't particularly, I think, because I'm... I, but, like, the grammar is easy. The vocabulary is not. Um, and in programming, there's not much vocabulary, actually. It's, like, the languages themselves have, like, 10 words, maybe 15 words. And then there's a certain degree of, like, you become conversant in the jargon. But I actually have not been very conversant in the jargon. Um, like, I remember going to university and... I was doing these projects and like homeworks and the instructors would be like, oh, you're using the composite pattern or something. And like, yeah, sure. That sounds like (laughs) that's a word for it. (laughs) Yeah. And now you're working at Apollo as like a senior software engineer. Um, Mm -hmm. You've described Apollo as like, or what you do at Apollo is weaving weaving the data of the world, or like the the graph Yeah, flex. weaving weaving the data graph. That's yeah. yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to do. So yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe just for someone who doesn't know like what Apollo is all about, can you give a brief brief idea of what you do uh, there? Yeah, so we do GraphQL. So we're I I think we're probably the biggest like GraphQL server and client. Like many many people use our use our server and use the client on the front end. And I'm on the I'm on the open source team, and specifically, I'm working on server. So right now, we're working on kind of the next generation of server. Um, I've kind of I'm starting to own like federation and yeah. figuring out how we. So federation is where if you have like a bunch of GraphQL services, you sort of stitch them together. Uh, but we don't call it that. You weave them together. <laughs> there was a previous version of this technology called schema stitching, which uh, was more cumbersome. Uh, so we don't call it that anymore. But you you can like expose a single uh, service made out of a whole bunch of other services, and so we're figuring out how to do like streaming and live queries and whatnot, especially in a federated context, which is interesting. It is a very interesting problem. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, sounds like a fun problem to solve as well. Yeah, you're a. I mean, you're you're a senior senior software engineer by day, mm-hmm. um, but outside of that, you've I'd like to say you're quite a prolific speaker, just because I haven't seen I've, a list quite as long as yours. I have. Yeah, it's true. Actually, <laughs> I, I've given a lot of talks this year. I've I've given a lot of talks. I've written a lot of talks. I've written too many talks. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I did four of them in a year, and these aren't. They're not like PowerPoint presentations. Like each yeah. one is its own presentation framework. Yeah, and each one has its own <laughs> audience. Like you can't just treat every talk the same because you've got this like a different group of people so it's yeah. going to shift slightly with each one yes but also i i totally can't. i've i've given learning from machines <laughs> many many times for example and it's it's slightly different like i'll like i give it in amsterdam and yeah. learning from machines is uh 
it's about uh, psychedelics and computational neuroscience and machine learning. It's like that intersection. And um, when I gave it in Amsterdam, the bit about psychedelics, you know, I like talked about mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> in addition to acid. Uh, but a lot of them, because they're so, it's like they're, they're whole productions, right? So mm. to varying degrees, they're, you see, they're scripted and they change a bit. Yeah. They change a little each time, but they also don't change that much. Yeah. I don't know if I should advertise that, but you can tell. <laughs> you can videos tell. of it, yeah. <laughs> um, but they're poems. It's like you can't you can't be like you can tweak them, but you can't like change the whole thing every time. Right. Yeah. So what are those? I mean, I'm interested because you you've obviously got this passion for, um, and we'll go into a bit later, like um, defining some of the terms within AI, just so we're like talking from a common place. But mm-hmm. like this passion for AI or this love for AI, like. What was, could you describe the moment when, like, you had that, that realization of, oh my gosh, this is interesting. I want to give a, I want to dive headfirst into this. Love is a very strong term. Um, (laughs) I, I can't conjure a moment, Mm -hmm. but certainly over, like, in my last year of teaching, um, which was a few years ago now, like two years ago. I I just started to get the sense that my job was not long for this world that that like I some combination of like no code stuff and machine learning and like it was basically going to become increasingly the case that maybe not my job but actually my this, this is maybe terrible but like my students jobs were going to become at least much less difficult to do. Um, and there would be many, many more people who could come in and just be like, yeah, I'll throw together a whatever, like, um, a lot of like a lot of front-end programming, a lot of web programming these days is kind of plumbing. It's like, oh, I'm going to attach this to this and this to this and this to this. And that's the kind of thing where you could, if you can, like, figure out how to articulate the constraints, you could have a, a um, machine learning system, kind of learn how to do it. Even if you can't figure that out, just like all the like Webflow and all of these like no code things, you can just like oh point and drag like all the connections together. And if you can, it's always been about that last like five ten percent where it's like oh it's broken and now nobody knows what's going on, right? Like now you need someone who actually knows how the thing works. But I think we're getting to where like you don't need that or like it breaks infrequently enough that that's that's like a rare problem. So I got the sense, and at the time I was most concerned about machine learning. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Mm, I better know this if I want to stay relevant. And so I didn't have any reason to learn it. So I just, um, so I went and pitched a talk to JSConf EU um, about it. And then they accepted it. So I was like, okay, now I have to learn (laughs) machine learning. Pretty good (laughs) forcing functions. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, okay, deep learning in JavaScript. I said I was going to talk about this. I guess I need to understand what's going on. And so I went and I understood what's going on. I, I like took Google's machine learning crash course and I explained it and <laughs> I spent 40 minutes explaining it and going through some examples in JavaScript. Uh, and then for uh, learning from machines, I kind of kept, I sort of, I've, I've always been very interested in cognition and so I kept sort of exploring the um, the structural similarities between uh, machine learning systems, specifically image recognizers, and our own visual systems. So maybe this is a good place just to, yeah, you know, like I said before, get on like a speaking from a common place. So like, how do you understand? And I think we said before, AI is like this catch-all phrase for things, but yeah. when it comes to machine learning and deep learning, like, um, and I guess just pretend you're explaining it to like five-year-old me. Like, how would you sort of distinguish between distinguish between the two and maybe uses or impacts are a good sort of like differentiator. Right, right. So AI doesn't mean anything at all, basically. Um, Machine learning is any, it's like this whole suite of algorithms to that um, extract meaning from data um, or they, they code data in some particular way or it's basically you instead of providing instructions, you provide a uh, goal function 
or a fitness function and the um, whatever machine learning algorithm you're using goes and figures out a optimal or like it, it um, successively improves upon ways to fit that. So with, um, what's the term? With unsupervised learning, the function is something like I want to find all the categories of things within this right. data set uh, where categories, things within a category, category are closer to other things in that category than they are to everything else. And it goes and figures out the categories. It doesn't name them. Um, to name them, you would need to associate like words with structures somehow. And so for that, you need training data, which means you need to have like a corpus of text and you need to have a system like go and say, try and assign names to things and then be like, okay, that's wrong. That's right. That's wrong. That's in between right and wrong. That's like this bad. And that's uh, supervised learning where you have labeled examples and you um, are, you, you either assign loss to them. So you're like, okay, this, this guess was like this wrong, or you have some sort of scoring feedback me mechanism. Cool. And that's that, that gradient loss that we've, I think, touched on before. Yeah, so that's, you, yeah, so yeah. with um, any number of stochastic gradient descent techniques, you have some kind of landscape that describes like how well all of the different models you could be doing are doing against this data set, and you try and, you just sort of tweak them yeah. um, and try and get it to be better. Yeah, and as it rolls down that hill, it gets more and more accurate as it starts getting better at knowing what it, what was wrong it, it gets more yeah it gets um yeah more and more accurate with regards to the data you're training it on right which can be a problem because you if you train it perfectly against the training data set it's probably not generalizing very well yeah and i think so for me at least like this the the field of machines and the realm of robots is like you know we see we often see um videos of like Boston Dynamics and right. like, like the kind of stuff they're pushing out. The like dogs doing backflips. Dogs doing yeah. backflips, like bipedal robots with incredible sort of like balance on two robotic legs also doing flips and running and like that. I mean, it's it's impressive. It's not that great, right? Like gymnasts do much better. Right, <laughs> yes. I mean... Gymnasts don't weigh like 300 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I bet there's some animal that does better, right? <laughs> Yeah. But that, but I mean, that animal can be programmed. Yeah. yeah, and I guess that speaks to sort of the potential. Is like, and I'd be keen to hear what your thoughts are. It's like, I think we can speculate on a lot, a lot on which direction that goes. But where, like, with those kinds of things specifically, and I'm sure it applies. And I'd be happy to sort of explore where else it applies. But like, where's the line between, like, that kind of spectacle, shifting from good to bad or bad to good, like doing good and dangerous. Like, I feel like that line is really hard to draw at the moment, which I think is why it's a little bit, like, scary, I guess, yeah. with that kind of tech. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's reasonable to look at that, especially in the context of it being, like, DARPA-funded. Like, what are they going to use it for? Right. Sniffing out bombs. Yeah, sure. I'm sure that is part of what they will use it for. Yeah. Right? Um, but I'm sure they're also looking at, like, how can we, like send this in like armed like or like with bombs on it to into cities and like do precision targeting right i'm i'm absolutely positive i'm not the first person to think yeah. of this and the first person to think of this was in the pentagon yeah. uh and that's scary is it scarier than like dropping bombs on people from drones uh <laughs> is it scarier than sending people in with guns i mean it's it's maybe more accessible than sending people in with guns like if you send in a suicide robot that's more acceptable to the U.S. population than sending in suicide bombers would be. Uh, but it's but if you just don't call it a suicide mission, then it's fine, right? right? So I think we I think like all technologies, technologies enable us to do things, right? Mm -hmm. They they give us more hands, um, and most so most technologies get used to do terrible things in addition to good things. Um, unless you take the view that like literally everything our presence on this planet is bad, which is a defensible view, I think. Um, but also very, um, it's like very anthropocentric, I think. So um, yeah, I think everything we make is gonna like do things across whatever ethical spectrum you care about. And we are already doing many, many terrible things. 
and yes, those will, technology will make those worse. And we're making, and we're doing some good things, and technology will make those better. And I guess a ro- like robots and machines still, even even if we can say they they sort of can learn from themselves and. I'm saying this loosely, like make their own decisions to a degree. It's like they are still created from a person. And what you're saying about like the ethics there is like some kind of ethics or morality. And those are pretty deep topics to like even, mm-hmm. even because I think that's even complicated. But that'll map whoever, whoever has built the robot for the purpose or has built the machine for a purpose. Some kind of their morality and ethics and values will map onto that machine. So if it's like a, I don't know what you think about that, but like, for example, the, the, the machine sniffing out bombs and stuff is like the person has a particular set of agenda for that robot to do a thing. The right, only reason right. it's doing the thing is because a human said, I need it to do this thing. Right. So it, it lets us amplify, Yeah. excuse me, amplify our own uh, value sets, yeah. which is, I think, why a lot of technology seems horrifying yeah. and why, like, we are in, we are increasingly sliding to the cyberpunk dystopia. Is first of all, access to technology is not even. So when I said like technology can, like technology will enable good and bad things. Y- right. Yes, in principle, I think, but in practice, who has access to it? Mm-hmm. Who has access to it is who controls the resources. People who control resources are better at playing this game of capitalism, mm-hmm. which seems to favor sociopaths. Which <laughs> it's like, <laughs> as you look at CEOs and like you go higher in executive yeah. suites, it's going to be more people who like were willing to kill others and eat them to get there yeah. if not literally <laughs> um, then figuratively so that that d- means that yeah technology is the, the the people who get to program those robots are likely articulating values that mm. don't lead to a world that I want to live in um, but again the robots are like mm, they're they're a problem maybe but are you familiar with the paperclip problem? Mm-hmm. Um, so this came up in Dissecting the Robot Brain, which is the talk I give at Merge. Uh, there's there's this famous thought experiment, famous, in uh, AI ethics called the paperclip problem, which is uh, if you... So you have, like, a very, very powerful AI. It can, like... It, you can give it any problem to optimize and it will expend like hu- it has access to huge resources and it can um, like maybe it's like a nanotech goo or something that could take right. over the world it's but like that like, Lucy movie with I don't know if you've seen that it's got um, uh, I can't remember her movie her name Scarlet anyways Jim yes Hansen. yes that one she's like the super she turns into the super robot with access to all the information in the world and can sort of like plug it into a USB doesn't she wait it's not Ex Machina it's no it's not it's like and it's not the one where she's an alien. No. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Cool. <laughs> anyway. And it's not the one where she's Asian. There's a few of those. <laughs> There's a few of those. <laughs> yeah. I think that was okay. Ghost, hey? Anyway, yeah, yeah. 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 Cool, um, but yeah, the paperclip problem. Yeah, so... And you set it to some totally benign task, like, make more paper clips. Mm. Well, if it's... If it's given no other goals, it's just going to kill everyone and destroy every ecosystem in order to produce paper, paper clips. Which, yeah, sounds bad, and people, like, get very, like, folks on this wiki online get, like, very in their heads about it, and they're like, oh, yeah, we need to make friendly AI. It's like, fine, yes, that's a conceivable problem, but if you replace paperclips with shareholder value, then you have described Amazon's whole business model. Like, do we think that Amazon wouldn't destroy the Amazon if it would make them money? No, they don't destroy the Amazon because it wouldn't make them money right now yet. Yeah. So... That's the problem. Right? The problem is that we've created incentive systems that lead to that, and we haven't like adequately controlled it, and exact in exactly the way that we are like abstractly concerned about AI. Because what is a corporation but an AI? Right? It's like something that optimizes for some goal, mm. and it's made of people. But so what? Yeah. The idea is that like maybe people will be able to exercise judgment and like control the thing, but. Clearly, that's not true. <laughs> like, clearly, the only people in a position to control the thing won't control the thing. Right. I think. I mean, that's maybe we have a an, not a skewed, but a, a slightly incomplete idea of AI in general. That it's kind of already always been around, and that it has. Yeah. I mean, I think there are lots of systems which are. Mm 
not human, but do information processing and come to some kind of homeostasis with their environment yeah. and reproduce and what are the other criteria for life? Yeah. Like um, those yeah, those things like high school um, biology is escaping me, but I guess yeah, yeah, they, they um, yeah, sorry, not come to homeostasis, but like they yeah. have an internal and yes. an external state, but that includes like societies right. follow all of these, like languages follow all of yeah. these criteria, um, capitalism, <laughs> it's like market systems, yeah. value systems follow these criteria, and they are they are kind of processes that run on our brains, right. on like uh, they're like. There are processes given tendency on an architecture that includes many minds. And yeah, I think you can describe them as they're not human intelligences, certainly. So this raises an interesting point in that all in a thought. If if that is true, that AI has kind of already always been around in some way, shape, or form, and like we seem to be kind of okay with using drones to drop bombs and not be overly afraid of that um is it maybe what's i mean we're not afraid of it because no one's dropping right drone yeah. bombs on our heads right i i think people for whom that's likely are pretty have scared a reasonable yeah. fear yeah. of it yeah um but is it maybe that like these these robots and machines are starting to like we were talking about structural similarities it's like they're starting to work like we do and even look like we do in some cases and now like for the first time we're coming face to face with something that like looks like us potentially thinks like us we've been pretty good at controlling humans with like laws and wars and society Wait, but no no we haven't what are you <laughs> talking about <laughs> like, <literally. laughs> but but do you not think that i mean like with these robots like we, we don't have an idea of I guess what the the capabilities are, but they like kind of look like us and kind of work like us. That like neural mapping and I I think you're right that they kind of look like us and yeah. that is squicky. Yeah. Especially the kind of part. If they looked exactly yeah. like us, that wouldn't really be squicky. People would get yeah. over it. Pretty and they fast. haven't been able to make it look exactly like us either. They've tried. Yeah. Some robots. Yeah. Like, mm, can see that's fake. Or if they looked kind of stylishly not yeah. like us, that that would also be fine. But they're they're like kind of the uncanny valley is real. Yeah. And that's why Boston Dynamics robots. But uh, that's probably not the only reason. But I'm right. sure one of yes. them is like that's why they're like quadrupedal and yeah. like not in any way trying to look human yeah um and they do kind of succeed in that sense like people are f freaked out by them because it's like oh it was a robot dog scary yeah. thing but like not so much in that like oh this is like creepy and it like might be smart kind yeah. of thing yeah so yes i think i think some of it is that that visceral reaction yeah. i don't i don't know that we should privilege that more than any mm. like <laughs> Yeah. than like more considered reactions yeah. and some of you saying you're i think it was learning the learning talk but it's uh you have this um this uh i guess uh perception or view that robots are still pretty pretty dumb or still dumber than mm -hmm. us um could you just tell me like yeah just talk through what you mean by that i mean aren't they like <laughs> have you have you ever met a robot? Like, really? <laughs> like, they're not as impressive as the Boston Dynamics mm -hmm. robots are. They're extremely, li they're way more limited than a six-year-old, mm -hmm. right? A, a six-year-old can, like, there's some things they can do that a six-year-old cannot. Like, they yes. can, like, carry hundreds of pounds, I'm sure. They can, like, there's something impressive. But a six-year-old can, like, na do all the very impressive things. Like, like, they can jump, they can navigate stairs, some of them can do backflips, they can balance, they can, and once we get to be, like, 14 oh my god or like a, adults there's a probably like where's the like peak of like moving around in the world it's like yeah. probably in your like 20s or maybe your late teens something like that you can do all these incredible things and you can think about it while you're doing it and you can like make decisions and you can like come up with long-term plans and nothing like no systems we have now are really even close to that and part of that is because we're not like really part of that is that it's very hard but part of it is also that we're not like really really trying to make general ai like the, this is the the term for like something that that can do all the human things it's like the what is that hard general ai right it's not there isn't that there isn't nearly so much money in it as like solving particular classes of problems 
Um, I, and I kind of think it's because if you, you can identify a class of work, like driving a car, which itself is like not easy, but it's like, it's tantalizing close because yeah. the long-term planning, okay, we know you can like build a highway hierarchy and like do this, do this long-term planning. And then the individual, the like moment to moment bits, it's like, well, we have image recognizers. We have like 5,000 kinds of sensor packages. Surely we can make a car that doesn't run too many people over. And honestly, it can run quite a lot of people over before it's as bad as people driving cars. So maybe we can like leverage that. So it's, it's a tantalizing problem, but it's still a very hard problem. We're still not even remotely there. It's still very easy for a company that like doesn't value safety to go and just like mow down pedestrians, um, like some companies we could name, Uber. <laughs> um, and I, fr I was throwing shade, so I forgot where I was going. Oh yeah, but like, where's the money in like, an AI that will do, that will replace the work of executives. Yeah. Mm, I mean, you could you could save some money on <laughs> like all those executive pay packages, right? Yeah. But who's going to approve that? Not the executives. <laughs> so, <coughs> so I think that's that's kind of it, right? Yeah. Or like replacing artists, like there's yeah so many artists in the world. <laughs> Why? Why would you need to replace them? Yeah. So we. I mean, they, they obviously still have their their limits in in what they can what they can actually what they. I say what they can do because they probably could, as you said, do those things. But maybe what they should do or what we want them to do, I guess. Well, there's what we are willing to pay to figure out how to get them to do. Right. And right now we're it's it seems like we're much more willing to pay to get them to do like particular like well defined tasks. Also, that's where that's just kind of the level of that's where the research is is like we can kind of do particular very well-defined tasks where we have um where we can sort of identify the goal function and be able to articulate it so that's the so there's this like one level of machine learning right where you you articulate the goal function and you we can we have all these algorithms you can apply to try and um to basically build a system that can optimize for that goal function. So then I think the next level is you um, describe like a meta goal function um, and it figures out what all the smaller goal functions are in order that need to be aggregated in order to build this thing, which you can kind of argue deep learning networks do, right? That it's like each layer is sort of ending up trained to, to extract certain um, patterns from the signal and then together the signal like correlates but doing that across like longer time periods longer it was sort of like streaming data sets and being able to sort of have something that like thinks and reacts over time um, and follows a hierarchy of goals that's we're not there yet we're not really even that close to that yeah and i think that's interesting because that touches on um conversation we had before as well it's like we the point you made about like what we're willing what we're willing to pay for these robots to be able to do is like um there's a lot of talk that you know through automation of like machines doing things for us that we can sort of get people doing like pretty mundane you know repeatable um sequenced work um out of that and just replace them with a machine and factories might be like I, I'm very willing to pay for that because there's a lot of labor cost for me. But the people who are actually doing those jobs probably wouldn't be willing to pay for it. So then it comes back into that like power of who they who, wouldn't be willing who's, to who's pay value for, for I mean, robots this, to replace their yeah, job. Um, like their own job. This is like their livelihood. Now robots coming to take take their spot. I think that's like and it's been a contentious issue right. as well. Yeah, I mean they yeah, of course they're they might they might pay for a robot to do their job instead of them, but they still get paid for it. Um, mm -hmm. But they wouldn't have, like, they're already getting paid basically the smallest amount that they yeah. possibly could, like, barely enough to live on. And so they can't can give half their salary to a machine. Um, but the obviously the factory can give half their salary to a machine and happily will. The main reason they have not done that in many cases is that they cannot you cannot make a machine that does that yeah. um, 
Fabric, for example, this is one of the classic, like every, every five years, some tech person is like, I know, we'll make a machine that can like stitch fabric and do everything. Fabric is so hard to work with every, just, and it's obvious once you've ever worked with it, which I think no one who like has this idea yeah. has, <laughs> it's like, it folds on itself. It like fun does funky things. It's like irregular. Yeah. It's like every single thing a machine is very bad at and particularly yeah. robots are bad at dealing yeah. with. And you can't like, like metal kind of will fuck it up sometimes. So you have to like use mm -hmm. some other kind of like skin basically is very good at touching fabric without damaging it. Which is a scary thought that that might be the way they fix robots. So they uh, yeah, skin. I mean, I think they can use silicone or skin. <laughs> I mean, I'm uh, growing human skin is, and putting it on robots is like the least scary thing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good to know. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that freaks me out. <laughs> uh, I mean, if it helps, the skin wouldn't really. It would need like a lot of substrate and stuff mm -hmm. to really survive, so yeah. it would probably have to periodically be replacing it with skin. Yeah, I guess it's stem cells. It's not like harvested, so maybe it's not <laughs> so morbid as like I have it in my mind. <laughs> yeah, no. What'll be creepy is the like used skin gloves, like the storage yeah. room of those. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's I, I think it's those those limits are interesting because I think even even within those there are like impacts you don't necessarily always go to so even if we're replacing factory workers to actually use machine learning and i think you mentioned this as well to like build machine or use machine learning as a way to then help those people learn their new job then it's like okay we're actually helping helping this yeah if you can like, use it to sort of increase the capacity of teaching yeah. available and it's still that's still very problematic right because it's mm -hmm. like maybe they didn't want a new job right um on the other hand if their current jobs suck that's it's maybe they're actually happier in a new job it's yeah it's complicated yeah um, and another so another sort of thing that we spoke about last time which isn't also a, has come up or at least the i've seen it come up um with like machine learning is like that and you alluded to it before it's like you feed this like unsupervised learning needs training sets or like some sort of data mm -hmm. right i think no it's supervised yeah. learning supervised needs learning needs training sets right and that when it comes to bias in machine learning, it's it's always like, okay, what, what data set was that machine fed? And right. was that data set skewed? Um, which right. is interesting because it's like, okay, then still the machines, I mean, can machines then be prejudiced in some way? Or is it the data sets they were fed and who fed them that data set that was prejudiced? The So the a particular model can certainly be prejudiced. Mm -hmm. um, a... It's like the gradient descent algorithm, I think, is not. I, it, it's, it would be very hard for me to see how it could be biased in any of the ways we think of bias, like right. against like particular people or groups, because we really are just like interchangeable numbers. Right. At That's the level like of those statistics then, right, rather than or. It's just, it's just like uh, the gradient descent algorithm itself is not going to be biased, but then the if you feed it a biased data set, it will yeah. of course learn those bias yeah. biases, uh, just like we do. Yeah, just like we do. Actually. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's unless you feed it, because again, those data sets are then I guess then work on. I'm just wondering if it's like any any kinds of considerations we can start thinking about now to avoid those avoid those issues or avoid those cases where a machine potentially creates a like a bias scenario it's like it's it's really hard to sort of but because you can feed it all the data in the world right and then be like it's completely objective um we fed it literally every single byte or bit of data that we have in like in the internet. well right but that doesn't make it objective right that no. means it will exactly recapitulate all the biases that exist exactly which you can so first of all you have to not think of the output model as unbiased in some sense. Mm -hmm. You have to think of it as representative, right. which means it's a study basically of, and in this, like, in this way, I think it's actually very helpful to have because it you now have something you have basically an oracle. You can be like, okay, what would, what would this? How would these sample of job applicants fare if it's like a um, job application thing? And you could be like, okay, well, there's, we've tested millions of examples and there's systemic bias. 
clearly in this company's hiring practices, which is actually a good reason to argue for these models having to be publicly accessible or at least accessible to researchers or some kind of oversight board. And that, from that perspective, it's like a val- valuable research tool. It can be valuable for organ- for advocacy organizations. Um, but obviously, the moment you like extract it from that and decide like like there's a some some model is being used for sentencing in some U.S. states, and it this thing has to it's like this thing has to be illegal. But like that's going to make its way to the Supreme Court, and then the people sitting on the Supreme Court are going to decide that, which is not exactly reassuring right now. Um, and it's there's there's this risk that we will see that people, especially people who don't exactly know what's going on, will say like, okay, well, it's a machine doing it, so it's, it's objective. Um, but I think it needs to never be a machine doing it, right? It's like someone is deciding to use that thing, like the judge is deciding to use this sentencing thing. And so if the judge's decisions are biased because they're using the sentencing thing, it doesn't matter why the judge's decisions are still biased and like are here's this evidence of um, of systemic racial bias in their sentencing. Yeah. The flip side of that is if you... You have to... You kind of have to be able to talk about it at a higher level, right? Because if you give this program to a thousand judges across the county, the county is like, you have to use this. Or, like, we strongly encourage judges to use this. Then you can't go after each individual judge. It's just, like, it's not going to happen. Um, you have to you have to sue the county at some higher level, which I guess um, the ACLU or someone is probably doing right now. I don't know how that particular case is shaking out. Do you know roughly how that that sentencing model works for it to be... I have absolutely no idea. My guess is it goes and looks at previous people who have been sentenced and is like, and they've trained a model on that, which obviously that's going to be biased. It's going to be extremely biased. I mean, that sounds like something (laughs) that should be like open source or transparent or something so that, that definitely should be right like you can you can make the argument that like google's secret sauce algorithm right. shouldn't be that yeah. those probably should at least be accessible in some sense that one definitely should be um our voting machines should probably not be machines yeah. th- but also they those should be open source and they're not and there's there's lots of there's lots of things that should be open and aud- auditable that are not because again the people who are incentivized to keep them closed have more money <laughs> yeah. because they were willing to do whatever it took to get more money. Right? Yeah. I think it's, it's going to take a while before um, machine learning and, or the fields of machine learning and deep learning are more accessible, like quite a long while to a large group of people. I think we've only just had, like tech is kind of accessible in general. You can pick up coding, you can become a software developer, but like, for people in low income low income states or low income households like to really be able to plug into machines and robots and not just be at the mercy of the people who have the money and are using them I mean, it's going to take a while I, I think we need a very very different way of allocating resources than in general, the, yeah. Yeah, in, <laughs> in general right because it's not how else do you solve it really yeah. um, and if you decide, okay, like Jeff Bezos decides somehow, like we we go, it's like we figure out that if we like shoot a laser beam through his head at this particular <laughs> angle, he'll have empathy again. So we do that, <laughs> and he like starts giving away billions of dollars to like buy like computers for everyone. So now there's this huge demand on computers, mm-hmm. which increases mining yeah. activity. Like computers are not great for the environment themselves yeah. to be made, and so we like destroy the world in that way. So it, it like needs to be a more holistic shift in how resources are both extracted and allocated, and what we like, how we value not just the like the like not just people and not just things, but the whole system that people and things exist within. Yeah, there's almost a like dystopian irony, even, even if we're using them machines to do all the good in the world. Like if we somehow figure out a way, like you said, to use lasers to tap into people's psyches. But um, I'm very into that. You just like shoot yeah. a laser right <laughs> through their head. And if it doesn't work, 
what's the last <laughs> <laughs> yeah, worth the try yeah. um but i mean yeah like if even if we manage to figure out a way of not using robots for bad and only doing good there's still some sort of mm-hmm. like weirdly dystopian irony in using these like robots to then help uplift people it's like this like they don't have access to the resources and we should be distributing resources better not putting like taking all of their resources away say no but we're going to build this really good thing that's going to help you so we need to mine the hell out of your country take out like all these things to put these robots and computers together um but then we still need to get those uh, like third third evolution products back to them right um it's um there's a term for this it's yeah. like a dynamic of colonialism yeah, yeah definitely. um and with your, so you, like, I, th- I think the, the sort of like neural mapping you've done is really fascinating, but out of like the, the sort of kind of projects you've worked with and the research you've done, the talks you've given, what has been something that you've like really come to realize about machines and robots and like the potential and impact of that for, or even like our relationship as humans to machines? Like what, 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 what maybe even not one thing, maybe it's a couple of things that you've come to realize. I think they're mirrors. Really, I think I think programming is a kind of cognitive mirror. So you are you are assembling concepts together in your idea of concepts, and the machine is evaluating them against po- often like much much more data than you have access to. It's like finding like going down all of these paths and reflecting back to you the implications, and that. That's why I think programming can be like almost addictive. Like people get into a flow with it very easily because you are, it's like you're thinking, you're expressing, and you're getting feedback exactly as fast as it's happening, right? So as fast as you're feeding it, it's going to feed you right. responses. And that lets you shape, shape these cognitive structures um, very effectively and also shape larger cognitive structures than you can hold in your head, like much, much larger ones and kind of different ones than different ones than we've been able to construct through any other mechanism, I think, right? Like, uh, like narratives tend to be linear. Programs are not linear, right? Like there's, they're made of linear sections and places, but they're, they're sort of interwoven tapestries. Um, they're, they're more complicated than, most other things we make, I'll say. They're they're certainly more complicated than most other things we have drawn up plans for. Like they're maybe not more complicated than cities, but the the sense in which we have planned cities is very different than the sense in which you plan programs. For sure. Um, and then they're also mirrors in the sense that we in exactly the sense that we're like, oh God, AI is going to like cause all of these terrifying problems the robots are going to cause all of these terrifying problems which are it's a lot like how a ton of apocalyptic fiction it's like in the future we are going to live in this like crap sack world where you can't drink the water where like every the air is unbreathable where like corporations run everything and they run with impunity that is the world that is the world that most people live in right now yeah. it's just not the world that the white people who wrote those books live in yeah. and so it like sounds horrible and maybe it's maybe they're right that like oh yeah the it's like the u.s and like western europe are going to like get there too but that's not that's that's not the problem right the problem is is like happening now and similarly we look at robots and we look at computers and we we like are creeped out and we think like this terrible thing is going to happen when actually this terrible thing is happening now and where do you see <clears throat> robots and machines like fitting into that now? Like, I guess we can call it a utopian picture, but like, where do you see that that place? What's of, the hope I have? After yeah, I, I just guess. said we should shoot everyone in the head with lasers. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm I'm writing a book. Nice. That uh, um, it takes place over the next thousand years. Cool. And. I, th- I think it's like f- I think it's fairly realistic, as, as realistic as anything that takes place over the next thousand years possibly could be, um, and it's so it's it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, and then it's like it's like actually quite good, and the turning points end up being um, biotechnology, which makes it easier to distribute 
sort of large scale production, hmm. or actually really easier to distribute small scale production. So if small scale ecologically preserving production. So if you can plant a um, if you can plant a town or if you can design a moss which anyone can grow, which you can spray and it like creates a wall. Right. Or if you can come up with a um, like a powdery gel E. coli like thing that eats plastic and becomes a moldable putty that you can make other things out of and then you like throw it back in the vat when you want to redigest it. That starts to let people shape their world and shape their world in a way that will sometimes be just as disruptive as now, but has a much greater potential to last because it comes to a homeostasis with the, again, not homeostasis, it, it comes to yeah, yeah. an agreement with the ecosystem that it's in. And that lets parts of, the, that lets parts of the biome survive and thrive, basically, while, yes, while capitalism is doing capitalism's thing. And, doing horrible stuff yeah so, so yeah it's 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 that idea of i guess yeah. robots and machines are not scared it's the people who are currently experimenting or like yeah. designing them that are scary um yeah. and oh and and then on top of that we uh we use we use the fact that um that machines are mirrors and we use the fact that we can shape them to sort of capture our thoughts mm -hmm. to like train um if you have like enough insight into the firing patterns of your brain, you can train something to replicate them. You can train a model to be like, oh, okay, if this is the stimulus, then this is what will be happening in there. Even if I don't know what that means, right. I can know what it is. And then from that, you can start to extract what it means. And from that, you can start to extract, here is what, here's what different emotions mean, or here's what different values mean. It's like if we meditate on compassion, and we observe that meditation, um, we can not just answer it within ourselves and try and write it down as people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. We can also create programs that can actually be compassionate and weave them into the world, which I, it is, it, that is both scary and because we could give power to those and actually be like, okay, we trust you because now you are like, you're not just friendly AI, you are, we actually think better yeah. than us, you're compassionate, but that's compassionate and like whatever, whatever right. set of values we, we think are important because it's not just that, like just and yeah. angry sometimes. Um, but that's like really the last time we'll have a say in the matter. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that might be necessary in a sense, like we, at some point, there will be a last time humans have a say in the matter, mm -hmm. one way or another, and maybe that's the way we should go. Yeah, it's almost like a it's something to that nature's is on its way, like that. It, it feels something, like it's, we're not going to be here forever. Yeah, right. So, being able to, in some spiritual sense, birth a child species mm -hmm. um, a, that can better exemplify our values than we can, and mm -hmm. might even take care of us in our old age yeah. that that is probably the nicest thing we could hope for yeah and I think that fear that you were talking about that like training robots to be compassionate and then handing that over that trust over is like um, and I think you've said it before it's like not not necessarily a fear of like the end of the world but it's that like fear I think you said it was like standing at the end of a cliff um <laughs> Which I really like. that was like a super poetic way of describing it wait this is this is the fear of um of robots, when we look at a robot and yeah. see doing all this stuff, yeah. I've described something as, as like the fear of standing at the edge of a cliff, and not the fear isn't that you're going to fall; mm -hmm. it's that in the next moment you might decide to jump, which I think is uh, yeah. from the incredible likeness of being. Cool. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if I would describe robots that way, <laughs> uh, or maybe it is because we might <laughs> the things we might decide to do yeah. with them yeah. are sometimes pretty terrible yeah. yeah so i mean you said you're writing a book <clears throat> is there a, a a date when you're hoping to have it i mean if someone wants to follow oh god follow it long <laughs> no there's no. not there's cool. no date um it's gonna be 
Cool, they it's going to be at least a year. Cool, they can I'm, just look out for Ashi yeah. Krishna and see. <laughs> yeah, I might start. I might start releasing pieces of it cool. um, sooner than that. We'll Sweet. See. I mean, otherwise they've you've got um, Ashi.io where people Ashi. can Ashi. Yeah. have a look at. Um, yep. I know you, you're also on Twitter quite quite regularly, right? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter Rakshesha. Cool. Um, and anywhere else that people can <clears throat> kind of follow you follow you along. I'm on Insta. I'm not really, really on Insta. I'm not a. I'm not an influencer. Not, a, <laughs> um, not in those ways, anyways. You. Not in not in those <laughs> ways. Yeah. So find me on Twitter. Or find my website. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, such an insightful conversation. That was really cool. Um, thank you so much. Um, what's interesting about these kinds of conversations is we could probably have these every week, and they'll be completely different. Um, yeah. That's just with true. the speed of things happening. Yeah. So. Um, I'm excited, even if we have another one next year or the year after. Uh, I would how, love that. How, really different, how different that's <laughs> going to look. I really hope I come to the next merge. I would, I would cool. love to come back here. Yeah. Sweet. But yeah, thanks so much. Thank you.